the mantras that the sleep world takes is that there are, you know, kind of three pillars of good health, and one of them is exercise, and the other is eating well, and the third, which people tend to neglect, is sleep. The short answer is we have no idea. What we can describe is a whole series of things that sleep does for us, and that, fee that list is expanding by the day. We know that it's critical for our well-being, feeling good, uh, having energy. We know that we become emotionally much less stable when we don't sleep. There are people who become irritable. There are people who become depressed. Uh, so we know that it's good for feeling well as well as performing well. We know that it plays a critical role in memory. So when you learn, uh, it turns out that when you sleep after learning, there's further improvement in your performance after a night of sleep. Uh, the areas that control sleep are very closely related to the areas that control appetite and metabolism. And so we believe that losing sleep may make you more likely to gain weight. Uh, there's evidence that it improves our immune system. So for example, it's been shown that if you get a flu shot and you are not sleeping well, it's much less likely to take than if you are well rested and sleeping well and get that same flu shot and you will be protecting. Well, it's not clear that all these things are the purpose of sleep. They are clearly things that make it desirable to get good sleep. What constitutes good sleep is not a simple one to answer. Um, the simplest answer, the one we use as clinicians, is that which makes you feel good the next day. So if you are someone who is lucky enough to feel good on a limited number of hours of sleep, and by that I don't mean two or three, but rather in the six range or five range that some of us force ourselves to do. If you feel good after that, then you're probably getting good sleep and enough of it. Within the hours of sleep, there is a quality element, and it's very hard to define. What we do know is that sleep is a very structured activity. You go to sleep not by just like going and parking the car in the garage, turning off the key and coming back the next morning, but rather by a very complex series of steps. If you disrupt, not the number of hours, but the transitions between those stages and frequently awaken, that's the easy one, or even get the stages in disproportion, you wake up significantly less rested than if they all go properly. So it's kind of like a choreographed ballet, and if you interfere with the ballerina's steps, the performance is less good. Coughing or things which relate to breathing are another example. So everybody knows when they're recovering from a bad cold and have a, a, a persisting cough or a, the after effects, they're no longer sick in the sense of having the infection, but they have the after effects of irritation of their tracheobronchial tree. Uh, they will cough and this can interfere with sleep, wake you up. Sleep hygiene is basically what your grandmother used to tell you and um, medicine took a long time to learn uh, was, was important. So these are the, the, the common sense things, plus a few that are not so common sense. And the first one is regularity. We have an internal rhythm. Our body tells us when it's time to go to sleep, and it tells us when it's time to wake up. So um, regularity is very important and responds to the body's internal need to stick to a clock. Uh, and trying to have a regular schedule where you get up at a time and go to sleep at the same time pretty much regularly is very important if you're having difficulty with sleep. The second important aspect of sleep hygiene is to avoid the things that disrupt sleep. So certain chemicals, caffeine being probably the most prominent one, and which occurs in not only the obvious coffee and tea, but also in many other uh, uh, soft drinks and so on which have caffeine added. This can interfere with sleep, and if you're having trouble with sleep, the first thing to do is cut that out. Um, in addition to that, sleep is all about habits. We teach people good sleep hygiene has to do with setting up a routine, and your body gets the cues and says, oh, that means it's time to go to sleep. And so that routine is very important. It doesn't really matter very much what that routine is. It has to be non-alerting but almost anything can become a good routine. And people with medical illnesses sometimes have a routine where they calm down, they take some medication, or they do some, some procedures or something on themselves, and that can become part of the routine too, to the extent that if you don't do it, you have trouble sleeping. If you do it, it signals to the body, now is the time to go to sleep.
If you can't get a good night's sleep, either by hours or because there's something disrupting it, what can you do to minimize the effect? There's nothing that you can make up for. You can't magically get the benefits of sleep without sleep. You can go so long without sleep and you can manage. Some people function very well, some people function much less well when they borrow on their sleep. They have a, an all-nighter, it allows them to make the presentation the next day. They may not feel good, but they'll function adequately. If they do it two or three days in a row, or they celebrate the presentation that kept them up all night by going out and partying all night, they pay a much higher price. And that's one of the things we have to be aware of. Um, probably the most important issue in that regard is to know that you are impaired in many ways and likely to fall asleep, but also likely to have what we call micro sleep. So the body reacts to not getting sleep by forcing you to sleep during very, very short little bursts. And one of these can last a few seconds, but your brain is asleep and not reacting. That may not be much of a problem. It just causes you to nod out and miss a conversation. But if you're driving a car, and you're on the highway, you can have these microsleeps and be completely unaware that you have gone momentarily to sleep. And if that's the point at which there's a curve in the road, or if somebody steps out into the crosswalk or a light turns red, that's when you pay the price. Not sleeping properly or not paying back the borrowing that you do because of financial or social requirements and so on carries a very big uh, price to it. Um, you can adapt to some extent to functioning sleep deprived, many people do, but you will feel miserable and there is pretty good evidence that in the long term you will pay the price of ill health. So there are long term cardiovascular consequences, it's thought to precipitate long term heart attacks, strokes and, and high blood pressure. Um, there is some evidence that not sleeping well advances the speed with which cancer progresses, so people who are getting chemotherapy and don't uh, sleep do less well than people who are uh, uh, well rested. So the first thing with any problem is to recognize that it's there and there are many examples of people who because they feel that sleeping less is a badge of honor don't consider that being a problem. If you understand that you feel lousy because you're not sleeping um, then the question is, are you doing it or is something doing it to you? If it's you that's doing it, the easiest resource is to try and change your environment to allow you more time in bed. And that's probably the most common solution to lack of sleep that we run into. On the other hand, there's some people who extend their time in bed and either can't sleep or the medical condition or the environment in which they sleep prevents them from sleeping and they're not able to solve that problem or figure out what's wrong. They spend eight hours in bed, they wake up, they're not rested. And that's when you really have to go to somebody who is an expert and can, can help you to address what it is that the problem is. Now the first line of defense, I guess, is your GP or your, your primary care provider. And talking to them certainly can identify some simple causes of disruption of sleep and give you some common sense. Well, Probably the best way to improve your sleep, if you have come to the conclusion that it's not good enough, is to first record what you do. So one of the things we recommend very highly before you go and see a sleep specialist is to keep a simple sleep diary. And there are now a variety of ways of automating that partially. So there are these apps like the Fitbit and these others which purport to record how long you spend to sleep. They claim to do a lot more, and to some extent they may succeed in telling you whether it's good sleep or bad sleep, but the most valuable piece from those devices is telling you, and they're pretty good at that, how much time you spend in bed and how much of that time you are tossing and turning, because that's exactly what they're tuned to figure out. You can do that with a piece of paper and pencil quite effectively. Just record when you put the lights out, and the next morning, to your best recollection, how long it took you to fall asleep. When you record that, and there are certain graphical ways of doing that, there are now computer programs that you can plot it, makes pretty pictures, but actually just a simple record of it, you'll start to see patterns and you say, gee, that's interesting. I wonder why I only sleep four hours Monday through Friday, and then on Saturday I sleep 12, and I feel so much better on Sunday. Oh, maybe those things are related. And it's amazing how often people don't put two and two together. Just recording it is the most important thing to get started. Think about things that are soothing. Try and 
not worry, which is very easily said, but not easily done. One of the things we recommend is a worry book. So a little pad of paper and a pencil or an iPhone into which you speak if you wish. And when you think of something that is worrisome, you say, oh, let me put that on the list. I'll worry about that tomorrow, but not tonight. And I'll write it down to make sure I remember to worry about it when it's a good time to worry about it. Another one that's very important is we have evidence that blue light, light in general, but blue light in particular, is very disruptive of the body's internal clock. And so spending a lot of time in front of a blue screen, or for that matter, any electronic device before you go to sleep can disrupt the ability to go to sleep 